Hello everyone, welcome to part 2 of our Spider-Man video game retrospective. If you didn't see it already, we opened part 1 with a look at Spider-Man, back on the N64 and PlayStation era from 2000, and now we're going to be diving into that game's sequel, Spider-Man 2 Enter Electro, which was released only a year later in 2001 on the PlayStation. Before we get into that though, I did want to address a small oversight of mine from the previous video. For some reason, I neglected to mention that Spider-Man co-creator and legendary comic book guru Stan Lee does some voiceover work in the form of some narration for the game. Not sure why I didn't mention it, because I think it's really cool, but it just kind of slipped my mind uh, when I was writing up that episode. So I mentioned it here partly to address that oversight, but partly because he also does it in this game, though it's taken a bit more of a backseat. Alright, well that's all of our setup out of the way, so let's talk Spider-Man 2 Enter Electro. Spider-Man 2 Enter Electro was developed by Vicarious Visions, taking over duties from Neversoft, and once again published by Activision. Though I can find no concrete evidence of this, speculation leads me to believe that it had a somewhat rushed development in order to capitalize on the first game's success. The game's quick turnaround, as well as the fact that it received generally much worse reception than its predecessor, indicates that it probably wasn't given the time it needed in development. It's also worth noting that the game was even delayed from its intended launch date, as its New York setting and final set piece made some reference to the World Trade Center towers, which were struck and destroyed by the tragic 9-11 attacks, which took place after the bulk of the game's development, but before its release. Whether it was the different developer, a short development cycle, or the need to remove some content so late in the game's development, the fact remains that Enter Electro did not perform as well with critics as its predecessor. Critics did not respond to this game as well as they had the first entry. And I'm sad to have to say it, but they were right not to. While the second entry in this two-game series has a graphical upgrade from the first, Spidey's suit now has that distinctive black webbing over top of the reds, it suffers in almost all other aspects. The basic nature of the gameplay remains the same this time around. Punches, kicks, webbing, and jumps provide the basis of combat and traversal, with web swings and wall crawling providing that distinctive Spider-Man flair. The combat doesn't do much new to change up how it functions, but the system is pretty basic to begin with, so this is forgivable. Especially since animations were changed slightly to at least change how combat looks. Slightly. One notable improvement is the ability to chain web swings together, though sadly you can still only activate them when you are within range of a target for the first swing, so it does little to alleviate fall-related deaths and the associated headaches. Level design is okay this time around. They've added more stages that take place at street level, including one level early on that starts at street level and ends with you ascending to the rooftops, at which point the game loads the next level, which is a rooftop environment. Tricks like this do kind of help to create the illusion of an interconnected world, however, seeing as the plot no longer provides a reason for not dropping to street level, as the first game Symbiote Fog did, it is simply more obvious that the game is compensating for its technical limitations. But so far we've stayed mostly on the surface. Let's dig a little deeper. What is the story of this game like? Sadly, the disappointments keep going on that end as well. When you first fire the game up, it plays a quick recap of the previous game, Saturday morning cartoon style, to remind you of what happened before and get you ready for the continuation of the story. This little recap video reads like a microcosm of the game itself. On the one hand, the developers went to the trouble of creating new textures for all of the characters from the previous game. Black Cat actually has a mask now, for example. Unfortunately, there is no payoff whatsoever. None of the characters or plot threads get brought up again. You could play Enter Electro without having ever played the first game and miss nothing. You don't get a rematch against a previous enemy now escaped from prison. There aren't a few rogue escaped symbiotes running around. Nothing. The only character to make a return appearance over the course of the narrative is the lizard who, sadly, is treated completely differently in this game with no explanation. At the very end, we do get a nod to the ending of the previous game, but it feels like more could have been done. The narrative is pretty lackluster overall. Electro needs a powerful MacGuffin, the Bionexus device, which will boost a normal person's bioelectric energies enough to power a city block, which would, of course, make Electro incredibly powerful. Unfortunately for him, the device is kept in pieces and he has to assemble it, and there is some certain element that he doesn't know is required to finally make the completed device work. This is nice, classic superhero fare. Sadly, it never goes beyond that, offering little in the way of wrinkles to the story. It is also disappointing how uninteresting the motivations for the villains are this time around. The previous game had the main villains of Dr. Octopus and Carnage, who were working towards similar ends, and hired Mysterio and Rhino on for their special skills. Scorpion, meanwhile, has a completely separate goal which dovetails Peter back into the central conflict, and Venom, motivated by the central conflict, has an entirely different goal in his antagonism of Spider-Man, ultimately becoming an ally. In Enter Electro, 
Electro takes center stage as the main bad guy, which feels somewhat lackluster after the double whammy of such heavy hitters as Carnage and Doc Ock, both of whom could headline a game on their own. Electro is hired Shocker, and Sin, and Hammerhead, and Beetle, whom you don't actually fight but who appears in a cutscene. These villains are boring because they have all just been brought on as hired muscle. They don't have interesting personal goals, they don't even have interesting perspectives on the objectives of their boss. The only character even remotely interesting, and who also could have tied us back to the original game, is, as I mentioned, the Lizard. The Lizard serves a similar role in this game to that held by Scorpion last time around in that he isn't directly pursuing the central plot of the story. However, where Scorpion is still a threatening presence which demands Peter's attention despite there being a larger game to be played, and ultimately comes back to bite him when it allows Jonah to call the cops on him, Lizard is simply a roadblock to speaking to Dr. Connors, a step he is taking to pursue the main bad guys. I should also mention here that, in the first game, Lizard had a cameo that was easy to miss in which he was sapient and helped Peter get out of the sewers in order to oust Venom. This time around, he is simply the mindless, slavering monster he is so often reduced to, and his previous appearance, or his army of lizard men, never get brought up by either party. It's a small thing, but it serves to highlight how detached this game is from the one that came before. It often doesn't feel like a sequel. The hero cameos are a little different here as well. Black Cat, Human Torch, Punisher, Daredevil, and Captain America are all absent. In their place, we get the X-Men. Well. In the game itself, we get Beast, which is kind of this funny because he appears like in the trouble. tutorial teaching Spider-Man how to use his various powers. Using square and Remember circle, this. I can punch the idea of another character teaching Spider-Man how to use his spider abilities will come up again in a much later game. Rogue and Professor Xavier also show up, because this time around the training modes are replaced by the X-Men's famous Danger Room, and those two particular X-Men run Spidey through the paces. This is fun and helps hint at a larger world, but unfortunately, like everything else, doesn't really pay off or tie into the story in any way. The X-Men don't show up to offer advice or help Spidey with his mission to save the city. A newspaper article at the beginning of the game continues the old Parker luck by giving Captain America credit for saving the city at the conclusion of the last game's adventure. This gets mirrored at the end of Enter Electro when Spider-Man is reading his Daily Bugle article that gives Thor the credit for stopping the electrical menace. Incidentally, that was one of the removed cutscenes I mentioned earlier, as apparently there was an actual scene in the game where Thor comes and talks to Spider-Man in response to all of the electrical activity, and in that pre-rendered scene, it was obvious that the climactic battle had taken place on the Twin Towers. Those newspaper articles I mentioned take over from the comic book covers from the last game, and serve to bridge the space between levels with either a quick recap of the previous mission, or a small tease of what's to come. They lack the artistic punch of the game-inspired covers from last time, but they are meant to be more in-world, and some of them have fun little jokes that make reading the fake headlines an amusing diversion between the action. There is one place where this game entirely outstrips its predecessor, however. Alternate Costumes The first Spider-Man featured an impressive list of alternate outfits pulled from a variety of comics and storylines. Each one offered various power-ups and upgrades that made sense, such as the iconic black symbiote providing unlimited webbing. The pool of unlockable costumes here is much more vast, drawing from more recent stories and delving deeper into Peter's past. Almost every single costume from the previous game is present with a whole slew of new ones as well, including concept costumes that famed comic artist Alex Ross did for the original Spider-Man film. They also keep the feature of granting powers and abilities to the player, with one wonderful addition. This time around, anytime you get a new costume, or one which grants a new ability, they are added to a kind of pool of resources. Then, from the game's Create a Spider menu, you can combine any three unlocked powers with any unlocked costumes to create your own custom playstyle with your own favorite Spider-Man costume. Sadly, I have to transition from talking about one of the game's standout features back into disappointments. You see, happily, this game was made back before the era of microtransactions and loot boxes which means that you unlock all of the costumes through regular hey gameplay. There, Some of them you unlock just by showing up, like others require very good. meticulous well, challenge completion in order to obtain, which is great, in the theory. The way. problem comes in when we start to look at the game's difficulty. There are a large number of contributing factors here, which I'll break down in more detail in a moment, but they all point to one thing. This game is freaking hard. Now, I should be clear here. I've beaten all the Dark Souls games and Bloodborne. I've played Fury to completion, and I'm currently in the process of playing Cuphead. I'm not saying this to try to get some kind of stupid gamer street cred. I'm saying this so you understand where I'm coming from when I say this game is hard. It's hard. Very hard. At times, controller snappingly hard. TV shatteringly hard. 
Level design can be complicated and difficult to navigate. It does a poor job of conveying what objectives are or how to accomplish them. Strict time limits on some levels compound with these problems to ensure you don't get a chance to get your bearings and understand a level. And the boss fights, oh my goodness. I first played this game years ago, obviously. I always remembered it as being difficult, though I never really pinpointed why. Looking back on the game with my more advanced game design analysis abilities, I figured out the problem. The camera. I know, shocker, but one of the big problems in an old action-adventure game is the camera. The camera has a few problems throughout the game, which is no big surprise, and the first game certainly did as well. However, in the first game, whenever you are engaged in a boss fight, the camera focuses in on the enemy, shifting Spider-Man's perspective and ensuring that you remain focused on the action. It makes it easy to direct your attacks toward the enemy and makes it clear where your focus should be. Given that the controls can be somewhat difficult, this does an excellent job of ensuring that it isn't difficult to beat up the bad guy and keep the action up. In Enter Electro, however, the developers attempted to create more intricate boss fights with environmental puzzles to solve. This, of course, means that the camera can't be focused solely on the villain. While this enables the player to walk around to, say, turn on water jets to douse Sandman, it means that actually seeing where Sandman is and fighting him is very difficult. As you might imagine, this makes it really hard to sell the fantasy of being that awesome superhero here to stop the bad guy and save the day. Had the game been able to implement an optional lock-on camera, this would have saved off a great many headaches. But, the game didn't feature an optional lock-on, so instead, we get pain-in-the-butt fights with pretty much every villain we face. This trickles down into navigating more intricate environments. There's a lot going on in some levels, but limited camera control means that you can often get blindsided by traps you couldn't see. All in all, the game does a lot to make you not feel like the super-powered hero you should be. Speaking of not being the hero you should be, Peter here isn't quite as finely tuned as he was last time around. Never mind the fact that his supporting cast makes even less of an appearance than before, there. as in well, they're non-existent and not even mentioned here. or thought about by Peter at all. One of the things I praised before was the lack of self-referential humor and how Peter was a good blend of smart, funny, and responsible. This time around, the funny seems to be a little more at the forefront. I won't spend much time picking apart all of the writing, but aside from a truly stupid Batman reference thrown in for no reason, there is one moment in particular that drives me crazy. Check it out. Get out of here. Quick, Spider Lad. You stop the plane and I'll get the bad guys. Oh, wait. I don't have a sidekick. I guess a handy dandy spider tracer will have to do while I rescue the pilot. <laughs> I don't think there's anything I hate more than a Spider-Man who just makes stupid jokes to himself so the audience has something to laugh at. Spider-Man's humor is supposed to be clever, it's supposed to be witty, and it's supposed to be a way for him to get at his enemies. It's not supposed to be a fourth wall breaking meta joke, and I just... <sighs> Let's keep going. I can't fight the lizard. One other neat addition that I really liked in this game was the inclusion of mini-games and sort of hacking puzzles that are designed to break up the action and the combat, while also highlighting Peter's scientific acumen and the fact that he is a genius. He's not just someone who's really good at fighting people. A lot of the background stuff is still the same. There are still galleries that allow you to look over character models and collected artwork. There are still the aforementioned training modes and costume collections. The game still allows you to bypass its arduous and nebulous difficulty spikes to unlock things with cheat codes. The game still has its moments, but it doesn't really feel like the standout must-play that its predecessor was. If you're a diehard Spidey fan, then of course, find the game if you can, set it to easy, and give it a whirl. But unless you really feel the need to flesh out your Spider-Man game collection, then you can probably afford to give this one a pass. All right, well, there you have it. That's our discussion on Enter Electro. As you can see, if you've watched both videos, I'm not really as enamored of this game as I was of the first one. And sadly, a lot of the things that the game executes poorly are a good idea on paper. The larger scale environmental boss battles with their kind of puzzle elements is really good and really Spider-Man-esque. It just kind of fails in the execution. So 
there are these ambitious things about the game that could have made it so good, and that's part of what makes it so disappointing. And again, that's kind of my opinion. Not everybody's going to like every Spider-Man game that comes out. This one just feels like there was kind of less heart put into it. You know how sequels can be, where the first one was really popular, so they just kind of... It was a separate team, they got other people working on it, they push it out, they try to get money, so... I think it's a shame. Um, it certainly doesn't do as much to push Spider-Man games forward, so unless you're a really, really diehard who for some reason hasn't played this game, I can't really recommend it as like a fun retro look back. The first game was the jump to 3D games for Spider-Man, and this game, well, it does some new stuff that I would like to see expanded on, such as the mini games and sort of some of the hacking and focusing on Peter as a genius, as well as somebody who can punch real good. I think that it doesn't really do enough to warrant a full playthrough on its own. There also aren't really as many interesting easter eggs or fun narrative twists or even really good utilization of the source material. You just get a really generic slog through villains with none of them offering anything super interesting. Again, if you're a really big Spider-Man fan or you disagree with me, then you'll probably really enjoy the game on some level. But if you are a really big Spider-Man fan, I mean, I still played it, so it might be worth checking out for you. And you might disagree with me entirely and think that it's actually really, really good. Le let me know in the comments below, because I'd be really interested to know what you think this game does well, because, as you just saw, I think it's kind of a letdown, which is a shame because of how much I love the first game. But while you're down in the comments, make sure to flip that like button and subscribe if you're new around here. And it would also be a real big help for us if you could share with any fellow webheads or other gamers that you think just might be interested in talking about Spider-Man. We're still relatively new and we're kind of trying to get our feet up off the ground, so anything that you guys can do to help Geek Garden grow would be hugely appreciated. Anyway, that's it for today. We'll see you guys next time when Spider-Man games get a little more cinematic. Adios.